Hello everyone, and welcome to the second day of our Doha Forum Youth Edition. I hope everyone was able to get some much deserved rest last night. We had quite the day yesterday, didn't we? From the desert exclusion in the early hours of the morning, to our tours of the Minaratain and Vinj Mood, and of course our scintillating roundtable discussions we had. Full as the day was, I hope everyone was able to walk away having been intellectually inspired and geared up for even more thought-provoking activities today. I'm Ahmed Naimi, and it's my pleasure to be your MC this morning. Distinguished guests, it is my absolute honor to welcome our first panelist of the day for some opening remarks. I'm sure many of you are as excited as I am for this panelist. Our first expert panelist received his PhD from the Princeton University Politics Department in 1987. He is the author of many books that have been translated into 60 foreign editions including The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering, Gaza, An Inquest into Mart its Martyrdom, and most recently, I Accuse, herewith a proof beyond reasonable doubt that the ICC chief prosecutor for two Ben Suda whitewashed Israel. His latest book, I'll Burn That Bridge When I Get to It, Heretical Thoughts on Identity Politics, Cancel Culture, and Academic Freedom, was re released just this year. In the year 2020, he was named the fifth most influential political scientist in the world. He is joining us all the way from Brooklyn, where it is currently 1 a.m., so I consider us very lucky to have him. Ladies and gentlemen, well, join me in welcoming Dr. Norman Finkelstein for an opening statement. Thank you for having me. First, please confirm that you hear me. Is it confirmed that you can hear me? Uh, can the end? We can hear you very well. Loud and clear. So you hear me fine? Yes. We can hear you very well, loud and clear. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I regret I'm not there in person, but in light of the events in Gaza, I felt it was more important for me to be home and to make uh, whatever contribution I can in order to lessen, to diminish the suffering of the people of Gaza. And so at the last minute, I had to cancel my uh, flight to meet you all in person. Uh, I'm going to just uh, first give some background to the events of October 7th and then allow my old friend, uh, Moeen Ravani to take the baton and to go through the events of the last six weeks. It's always difficult to figure out a starting point. Where do you begin the story? I'm going to begin with 2006. Uh, in 2006, the President of the United States was George Bush Jr., and he had embarked on what was called a, a program of democracy promotion. And democracy promotion took the form in the occupied Palestinian territories of telling the Palestinians that they should have elections. And the Palestinians proceeded to carry out elections. Hamas, the Islamic movement, originally didn't want to participate because Hamas was opposed to what was called the Oslo peace process. And since the elections were part of that Oslo peace process, they were against participation. But then they reversed themselves, and they did participate. And to everybody's surprise, including, if my memory is right, Hamas itself, they won the election. And our own president, when I say our own, I mean the United States, our own president, Jimmy Carter, was in the occupied Palestinian territories at the time to monitor the elections, and he pronounced them completely honest and fair. Well, 
these completely honest and fair elections were held, Hamas won, and the first thing Israel did was to impose this brutal economic blockade on Gaza. And that was followed by the United States and the European Union, which imposed sanctions on the people of Gaza because they had participated in a democratic election, which the United States had told them to participate in. Our own senator at the time, Hillary Clinton, who subsequently went on to run for president and to lose, uh, Hillary Clinton said after the election that the United States had made a mistake. It should have rigged the election to make sure that our side, meaning the side she supported, won. In the United States, that's called democracy promotion. Now, before I get to what happened after that economic blockade, I have to tell you just a little bit about Gaza. What is it, this host stamp on the world's map? Gaza is about 25 miles long, which means it's shorter, the distance is shorter than a marathon. And it's about five miles wide. It's among the most densely populated places on God's earth. It's more densely populated than Tokyo. Gaza, uh, its population, 70% of its population comprises refugees and descendants of refugees. That is, 70% of Gaza, its population originated in 1948 when Israel expelled the Palestinian population from the area that came to be called Israel. And about 250,000 of the Palestinians who were expelled from Israel ended up in Gaza. And now they, those who were expelled, and their descendants comprise 70% of the population of Gaza. The second thing to keep in mind about Gaza is it's a child population. About half of Gaza comprises children. So I think I heard that the people in this room that you're currently seated, it runs the age, I think the person, the MC said, of 18 to 33. Well, half the population of Gaza is younger than anyone in the room where you are currently seated. They are younger than anyone in the room where you're currently seated. So that's the demography and the geography of Gaza. And that leads us or leaves us to the socioeconomic situation in Gaza. Because of the blockade that is, has been imposed on Gaza, because of that economic blockade, about half the population of Gaza is unemployed. And about 70% of the youth in Gaza, basically, the, the age of the people in this room, about 70% are unemployed. They have no job. So if you look around in the room and you count seven of every 10 people in the room 
has no job in Gaza. So that would be roughly, since I was told there are 80 delegates in the room, so the 80 delegates, about 56 of the 80 delegates would be unemployed in Gaza. Now, Gaza is sealed shut. Nobody can go in, nobody can go out, with the rarest of exceptions. Nothing, we're talking now not about people, but goods, nothing can go in and nothing can go out from Gaza without the approval of Israel. Now, you might take away from that that, well, Israel is protecting itself from security threats, and that's why it carefully monitors what goes in and what goes out. But that's not correct. There have been periods in the history of the blockade of Gaza where Israel wouldn't let in any chocolate, Israel would not let in any baby chicks, Israel would not let in potato chips. In fact, the list of things Israel banned, prohibited from going into Gaza, was so long that they decided to just print what was allowed to go into Gaza. Because so many products, basic products of human existence had been banned, that it was seen as more economical to just print a list of the things that could enter into Gaza. There was also a period where Israel actually calculated the caloric, the calorie intake of each person in Gaza and allowed for enough food to enter Gaza such that their diet would be, the people of Gaza, their, their diet would be a starvation plus diet. That is to say, a diet, a caloric intake, a calorie intake, such that their diet was just above the starvation level. So, no jobs, barely enough to eat. As of now, half the population of Gaza suffers from what the humanitarian organizations call severe food insecurity, which basically means for about half the population of Gaza, they've never experienced a full stomach after a meal. Well, those are all individual pieces of information and then what is the final picture if you take all these pieces of information and put them together? The former conservative prime minister of the United Kingdom, after visiting Gaza, he said, it's an open air prison. Now, Israel's one of Israel's senior security uh, officials. He said as far back as 2004, he said, Gaza is, and now I'm quoting him, his name is Giora, G-I-O-R-A, Island, E-I-L-A-N-D. He said, Gaza is a huge concentration camp. 
So basically, if you were to plot it on a spectrum, Gaza is somewhere between on one end of the spectrum, an open air prison, and the other end of the spectrum, a huge concentration camp. That I think is not, that I think is a fair description of the life that the people of Gaza have had to endure, except it's only half the picture. We've had this brutal, heartless, illegal blockade of Gaza for 20 years. What the Goldstone Report, named after the South African Jewish Zionist uh, jurist from South Africa, in his report, the Goldstone Report, he said a case could be made that this blockade is a crime against humanity, which is a high level crime under international law a crime against humanity. What makes this blockade or this crime against humanity unusual is its length, its duration. So you might argue that when Israel dropped two 2,000 pound bombs on Jabali, a refugee camp, a densely populated refugee camp a couple of weeks ago, you could say that was a crime against humanity. However, it lasted about a second. People were killed, about 200 people were killed, but its duration was about a second in time. In the case of the blockade of Gaza, it's a 20 year long, 20 year long crime against humanity, which the whole world is completely cognizant, aware of, but allows to continue. However, that's only half the story. The other half of the story is every few years, Israel, what it calls mows the lawn, lawn in Gaza, mows the lawn. And mowing the lawn in Gaza means every few years, 2008, 2012, 2014, every few years, Israel commits a high-tech massacre in Gaza and kills a thousand, two thousand people, three hundred, five hundred children. And it's that combined experience of the daily misery and the periodic massacre that virtually every one of those young men on October 7th who broke through the gates of Gaza that they had experienced from their birth to October 7th. Virtually every one of those young men who burst the gates of Gaza had been born into that concentration camp, which every few years turned into an inferno. Thank you, Dr. Norman, for that insightful contextualization of the situation in, uh, in Israel and Palestine. And uh, please pardon my interruption. Um, now no let problem. me invite to the stage his panel. First up, we have Tagreed Al Khodari. Before moving to the Netherlands, Al Khodari was the New York Times correspondent in Gaza from 2001 to 2009, an analyst for the International Crisis Group and a TV reporter for Al Hayat Al BC. She covered the Second Intifada, Israel's unilateral withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, and the Palestinian Civil War in 2007 and the war on Gaza in 2008 to 2009. Al-Khudri also trained journalists in Palestine and Sudan. She worked for eight years as a senior editor for Fanac.com, a chronicle on the Middle East and North Africa. 
Currently, she is giving media training. Next, we have Mu'een Rabbani. <laughs> Mu'een Rabbani is a researcher, analyst, and a commentator specializing in Palestinian affairs, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and the contemporary Middle East. He has previously served as Principal Political Affairs Officer with the Office of the UN Special Envoy for Syria, Head of the Middle East with Crisis Management Initiative, and Senior Middle East Analyst and Special Advisor on the Israel-Palestine issue with, the, with International Crisis Group. Rabbani is a co-editor of Jadiliya and contributing editor of Middle East Report. At Jadiliya, he edits the Quick Thoughts feature and is host of the Connections podcast. A graduate of Tufts University and Georgetown University's Center of Cont for Contemporary Arab Studies, Rabbani has published, presented, and commented widely on Middle East issues, including for, the, for most major print, television, and digital media. And finally, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Safa Jabbar. <laughs> Safa Jabbar is currently pursuing a Doctor of Judicial Science at Hamid Makhalifa University, HBKU College of Law in Doha, Qatar, where she also served, uh, uh, works as a research assistant in the areas of law and technology, as well as human rights law and humanitarian law. Safa completed an LLB at Qatar University in 2021. She then went on to pursue an LLM in international law and foreign affairs at HBKU College of Law. A round of applause for our panel. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Good morning and welcome to our panel today under the title Bridging a Divided World, the Politics of Peace. It's my pleasure to moderate uh, today's panel. I just want to add that I am a Palestinian. I was born and raised in Gaza and just commenting, com commenting on what uh, uh, Dr. Norman has said that most of the people there are already refugees. I am a refugee from a small village called Fallujah. So um, since the war erupted in Gaza uh, following the 7th of October, a war of narrative, a war of media, a war of legal arguments has also erupted regarding the genocide committed in Gaza. So our panel today is aim to contribute to such debates regarding the situation in Gaza by gathering some of the world's experts in different fields, including media, international law, uh, international, uh, international affairs and politics, and opening the floor for future leaders as you to contribute to such debates. Welcome to our panelists and thank you for joining us uh, today, our discussion today will take the following structure. I will ask each of our panelists uh, a series of questions, and then we will uh, have uh, each one of them will have like from three to five minutes, sometimes two minutes, to answer uh, these questions, and then we'll uh, open the floor to an open uh, session of Q and A. Uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, Mr. Moin. Uh, um, we heard from Dr. Norman about the, um, the history of Gaza and the blockade over Gaza since 2006. I would like to hear from you the context of what's going on in Gaza the f following the 7th of October. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Is, yeah, thank you very much, and also my thanks to um, the Qatar Foundation for hosting this event and inviting me to participate. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, say a few brief remarks about the shorter term context of um, the attacks of October 7th. Uh, Norman explained very well, I think, the historical context. Um, but if we look, I, I mean, it's Hamas entitled this um, Operation Al Aqsa Flood. I think perhaps a more appropriate name would be Operation Prison Break. Um, as, as we've just heard uh, from Norman. But we have to look at what had been happening um, in the Gaza Strip in the immediate lead up. And I think many people tend to tie these events to the policies of 
the Netanyahu government. And while I think those policies certainly played a role, I think it's also important to understand that the preparation for October 7th couldn't have begun after Netanyahu assumed office again. Um, they must have started before then. And the reason I'd like to point this out is because Israel has already for years decided that it has the power and um, the determination to resolve the question of Palestine unilaterally without any reference to either negotiations with the Palestinians, Palestinian rights, Palestinian interests. Israel will go issue by issue, acre by acre, decide its final status and implement it with, I should add, um, effectively unquestioned um, US support and at, at best, um, at worst, passive European um, acquiescence. Uh, and so if we look at what had been happening in, in the past few years, you had this, you had the um, growing incursions into the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And of course, you know, the Israelis had persuaded themselves that Hamas only cares about maintaining its rule over the Gaza Strip. I think that is something they care deeply about. But to go from there and to say, well, anything they say about prisoners or Al-Aqsa or um, settler pogroms in the West Bank, that's just rhetoric. That's just window dressing for them to conceal the real agenda. Well, we found out on October 7th that that wasn't the case. So now addressing your question directly, I think first and foremost, um, uh, Hamas wanted to shatter the status quo. You know, in 2018, you had the Great March of Return. Um, a few hundred Palestinians were shot dead, many more were wounded, and in the end, nothing happened. Uh, things went back to um, uh, the realities as described by Norman. In 2021, for the first time, it was Hamas rather than Israel which initiated the armed confrontation. And just as importantly, Hamas initiated that confrontation for issues that had nothing to do with the Gaza Strip. They did it because of what Israel was doing in the Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem and because of what it was doing in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, and um, that was called the Unity Intifada because at the same time, you had Palestinians rising up in the West Bank, rising up uh, within Israel, growing demonstrations um, uh, in the surrounding Arab states and throughout the Arab world. And in the end, that was brought to an end and nothing changed. And it was on this basis, I think, that Hamas calculated it needed to do something spectacular, if you will, if they were going to irrevocably uh, shatter uh, the status quo. And, and that, I think, um, helps us to understand uh, the events of the past two months. So first you had October 7th, and then the question becomes, okay, we understand what Hamas's agenda is. What is Israel's agenda? Well, if you look at what they've been doing and listen to what they've been saying, you don't need to be a rocket scientist um, to figure out what their agenda and objectives are. Um, First of all, I think it's fair to say um, that a key objective of theirs is to ensure that there is a Palestinian body count that is exponentially higher than the Israeli body count on October 7th. Um, this is what the Israelis call deterrence. In other words, you kill one of us, we'll kill 100 of you, and then you won't dare uh, raise your head again. Whereas in fact, as uh, you know, October 7th, I would argue, is a consequence of, of this uh, mentality. And um, so th that's their first objective. The second objective is, I think, given the extraordinary level of, of uncritical and unconditional US and European support, is that Israel sees an opportunity um, uh, to unilaterally resolve the Gaza Strip question, problem, whatever you want to call it, um, definitively. And you may remember that in 1992, former Israeli Prime Minister uh, Yitzhak uh, Rabin um, said that he wished that the sea would swallow up 
uh, the Gaza Strip. Well, it didn't, but Israel has had an ambition, dating back to the 1950s, of thinning out the population of the Gaza Strip. So in other words, first they dispossessed and disinherited these hundreds of thousands of people who ended up as refugees in the Gaza Strip. Since then, they've wanted to send them into the desert to the Sinai Peninsula or to Libya or to Iraq because, and I think it's understandable, you know, um, if you had uh, robbed your entire neighborhood blind, you wouldn't want them living next door either. Um, and so Israel has always had this ambition to remove a substantial portion of the population of the Gaza Strip, particularly the refugee population, farther away from its um, uh, borders. Um, will they be able to achieve this? I wouldn't be so sure, um, and I know I don't want to go on for too much longer, but um, I think Egypt is determined not to make, as, as the Egyptians would put it, we're not going to let you um, transform Israel's Gaza problem into an Egyptian uh, problem. And secondly, I think I, I would, um, I think it's important never to underestimate the resourcefulness of um, the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip. As I'd like to point out, um, during this blockade that Norm was describing, these are people who started using cooking oil um, to power cars because there, wasn't, there was insufficient uh, proper fuel. Uh, Tahrid will tell you that at the time, you know, Gaza City, basically the entire city smelled like a falafel stand. Um, there's a, uh, a sunken British ship off the coast of Gaza. I think it's been there since the 1940s or so on. And divers went out and started cutting out parts of that ship uh, to make uh, rocket tubes. So, you know, um, yes, Israel is seeking to make the Gaza Strip unfit for human habitation if it can't force the people out. But when you take into account Egyptian policy and the resourcefulness of um, the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip, I wouldn't necessarily conclude that what Israel wants, Israel will get. So in the meantime, um, they seem to, you know, this, this stated objective of eradicating Hamas um, as a movement or as a military force, this is, um, these are pipe dreams. I mean, the United States um, spent what was it now, 20 years trying to eradicate Al-Qaeda, um, uh, which is a much smaller organization, um, which, which has a completely different um, uh, agenda and is much more isolated, which doesn't have any international uh, support, and it still hasn't succeeded. And here you're talking about a movement that is deeply embedded in society, that has won a free and fair uh, democratic election, um, that despite the boycott of the West is recognized as a legitimate political movement in, in much of the region and has a presence in multiple communities. And Israel would like us to believe that all it needs is another shipment of American um, deep penetration bombs and it can uh, solve the problem. I don't think, um, uh, I don't think that's, that's going to work. So to an extent, we are seeing a test of wills but again, I think it's important to listen to um, what the Israelis are actually uh, saying. Um, they are making a point of emphasizing that for them there is no distinction between civilians and combatants. Um, uh, they are deliberately targeting uh, civilian infrastructure. And I think wh what we're seeing is an orgy of um, revenge by a military that is a very effective killing machine, but is no longer a serious uh, fighting force, especially when it comes to ground operations. Thank you. Um, so we are going to talk about the future of the, um, of the situation at the end of the panel. And as you mentioned that maybe they can kill individuals and uh, commit it uh, like uh, genocides, but they cannot kill um, the ideology and uh, the ideas. I want to move to you, um, Tagherid. Uh, you, as a journalist, 
uh, how do you think that the Western media uh, covered the situation in Gaza, the humanitarian situation and the genocide? Do you think that they were uh, complicit about uh, the genocide in Gaza? Is it okay now? Yes. Thank you so much, guys. I'm extremely angry <laughs> at the Western international media. I'm extremely angry that they are accepting the order by the Israeli government of not going to Gaza. Same they did during the attack on Gaza in 2008 or 2009, which I covered, and I was the only one covering it for, for the New York Times. I'm extremely angry at those media stars in the international mainstream media for not putting any pressure on Israel to go. Yes, Israel told them, you cannot go to Gaza City. Gaza City is the place that is dangerous. But they could have gone to the south because Israel, at the beginning of the war, they said, the South is safe, so how come the international mainstream media did not push hard to go to the South and to cover? I'm extremely angry that what happened to my city, Gaza City, which I covered, but I was also born, raised there. It wasn't covered, those people, that were killed, their stories were not covered. We don't know, you don't know their names, you don't know their life stories, you don't know anything about them. What, what, what makes me so angry at the international media, they are embedded, living the Israeli narrative. They are either covering from Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. So they are not only covering the Israeli narrative, they are living it. So the stories that are coming from the Israeli side is extremely rich. It's moving because it includes people, the life stories of people. And you feel it, you feel it. But when it comes to Gaza, Gaza City, it's covered as a news item. And that makes me so angry. I find it racist and I find it not equal and not objective at all. So if I watch CNN, I go crazy because all the features, the, the human stories are focused on the Israeli side and it's pathetic when it comes to, the, when, when it comes to covering Gaza. The way the Ar Shifa hospital was covered is pathetic. So the Western media, since the beginning of the war on Gaza, and we have to be careful when we use the term war. War means two, two armies. So this is a question for you guys to, to always bear in mind. It's not equal. So they said, so Shifa Hospital. So from the beginning, the Israeli army they fed misinformation. They made us believe there is like, like a, a headquarter of Hamas underground. And, the, and everybody believed it, you know, the, like, like we really believed it. They were so good in selling that. And at the end, so the outcome, they erased my neighborhood. They destroyed the parliament, the Palestinian parliament. This is an address for them. Everything, like any sign of life, is killed in the sake of reaching that spot, Shifa Hospital. And at the end, what was pathetic, they brought incubators, you know, kind of propaganda. But where the hell is the electricity? How come? You know, it's like, so, and, and those journalists who went embedded with them, like the international, it's like, you know, they, they, at the end, there was nothing. So what we have to be careful with, when the, the international mainstream media 
is not giving context when it comes to the Palestinian narrative. So the word victims, when it comes to the uh, Palestinian narrative, it's not mentioned. The word apartheid is not mentioned. Genocide, war crimes, they are not even questioning it. And you know, even someone like Amanpour, which I watch her program, I find it so, so misleading when she comes with a fact with her like, uh, you know, like you believe it like, you know, as an audience, when she says, oh, those Palestinians that never accepted any peace deal, wrong. It's factually wrong. I am so angry at the international media for not bringing a context to the story of Gaza. I have to say, thank you, Wael al-Dahdouh, for making me, the Al Jazeera correspondent, who covered till November 10th, Gaza City. He was, he just left Gaza City November 10th, giving, you know, what Israel was aiming for, you know, like complete uh, wiping out of the entire city. So he covered, and thanks to him, I learned what's happening to my city, to, to the people over there. Thanks to the social media and to the young people, without the social media, we know nothing about the story of Gaza. And uh, am I too long here? I just want to, to ask, we've, we've seen, uh, you mentioned that we've seen like embedded um, uh, journalists within the IDF, the, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces. What does this tell us about journalistic integrity? I mean, so, you know, of course, journalists had no choice, but many of them are excited. They will go, of course, as embedded. Some of them are critical, but at the same time, they, what, what is the coverage? Only Israeli propaganda. Because they are not covering Gaza. They are not on the ground in Gaza. So the story of the Shifa hospital was completely like uh, driven by the Israeli narrative that is fed by the Israeli army. So 100% propaganda. Luckily, we have some international journalists who are skeptical, you know, questioning. But for me, it's like I'm so angry that they did not push Israel to let them go and to live the story of Gaza. It is genocide. It's war crimes. And, and it's so sad. It wasn't covered by those. And, and, and you know, we have to be honest. Many in the West will not believe it unless a white man or a white woman is talking about it. That is the sad part. There is a segment within the European society or the American society won't believe it if someone like me or someone like Moeen will talk about it. They believe someone white. And, and sadly, that element was completely missing. Yes, and thanks um, to the social media that we have uh, more stories and more context of what's going on on the ground. Unfortunately, the connection is not always there, so they can cover um, everything. Uh, so I would like to go back to Dr. Norman. And we've seen um, a dehumanization campaign against Palestinians. And you've already brief previously talked about the weaponization of the memory of the Holocaust by Israel. Do you think there is a link between that at w and what is happening now? Well, from the very beginning, from October 7th, you began to hear almost nonstop that what happened on October 7th was the biggest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. And as a factual matter, that might be true. However, I would have to say it's such a leap to go from, let's say, Auschwitz concentration camp when 10,000 Jews were being killed each week to what happened on October 7th as if there was any basis, any link, any logical connection between those two events. One I'm not in any way trying to diminish the significance of 
1,200 Jews being killed on October 7th, not just Jews, obviously also Thai workers uh, and some Arabs. However, that has no connection whatsoever to the reality of the Nazi Holocaust, where 1,200 Jews would be mowed down by machine guns in the blink of an eye. So this was just a propaganda exploitation of the Nazi Holocaust in order to drag the Holocaust in to a situation that numerically, historically, had no relationship to what happened in Gaza on October 7th. And then the media start to come up with these totally ridiculous stories about how some of the victims on October 7th had passed through the Nazi Holocaust. Yeah, and in, in this you know, regard... this sorry. is so contemptibly stupid. My parents were in the Nazi Holocaust. I buried them 30 years ago, 1995. And now they're inventing these Holocaust survivors who were taken hostage or killed on October 7th. This is just the grossest, most vulgar manipulation and exploitation of a genuine historical tragedy during World War II in order to justify the genocide against the people of Gaza. On this, on this I would like to hear from you. Can you just um, tell us the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? I think this is a basic question, but it's, uh, it, there is uh, many uh, comments about this now. I, I don't feel we should get into semantical questions, questions uh, that you might discuss in a philosophy seminar as to what's happening in Gaza. As anybody in the United States can tell you, the largest, most organized and conscientious demonstrations against the Israeli genocide in Gaza are being conducted by Jews. If you take the biggest demonstrations, be it at the main terminal in New York, Grand Central Station, or at the landmark, the Statue of Liberty, or in the very biggest demonstrations in Washington, the biggest contingent is always Jews. So this idea that somehow this is an Arab versus Jewish or Muslim versus Jewish conflict is completely ridiculous at this point in time. Yes, in the past, the number of Jews who opposed Israeli crimes was a small number. But now the numbers are so large that to try to claim the opposition is all Muslim or Arabic is ridiculous. I'll give you one example. It's a kind of funny example, which Muin will appreciate. On several college campuses now, the presidents of the colleges have banned, prohibited, what are called the Students for Justice in Palestine organizations, the SJPs. The funny thing, about, and they say they're banning them because of anti-Semitism. Now, for a large part of my life, I spent going on speaking tours sponsored by the SJPs. And you know what's the irony? And Mui knows, is, knows exactly what I'm going to say. The SJPs, which are being banned because they cause anti-Semitism, they're overwhelmingly Jewish. If you go to places like Columbia University, which just banned the SJP, they're mostly Jews. 
So I don't think we have to go into these fine distinctions between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. The fact is a large portion, maybe one third of Jews under the age of 30, at this point, about one third do not support what Israel is doing to the people of Gaza. Yes, thank you. And going, f starting from the demonstrations, um, Moeen, I would like to hear from you, like there seems to be a gulf in the public opinion and the official uh, positions, be it in uh, the UK, the US, France, Germany. How do we understand this gulf? And are these um, like public pressure going to shift the official positions? Yes, yeah, so... In two so minutes, please. In two, yeah. Well, that's two questions. Um, the first one is, I think, for a number of decades now, we have been seeing a growing disconnect um, between rulers and ruled um, uh, in the West. And I think this is one more symptom um, of what we're seeing, where you have the political class all lining up solidly um, behind Israel um, and public opinion uh, increasingly opposed to um, uh, government policy. Um, and I, I think, as you pointed out, it's a problem not only in the United States, um, it's also, I think, uh, very evident in Europe, even though in, in, um, in Europe not all governments have, have been quite as extreme as um, the United States. Um, now your second question, will public opposition to government policy have an impact? I think over the longer term, it will. I will say that um, uh, in Europe, voters matter. Um, uh, and I think they're more likely to have an impact in, in European countries. In the United States, I think half the people don't vote. Um, Congress is basically um, purchased by uh, corporations and, and, and lobbies. So I think the, the democratic process in the United States is, is much more superficial um, uh, and, and much flimsier than, than it is in, in many European countries. Uh, that doesn't mean that these um, demonstrations uh, and opposition, particularly if, particularly if they're sustained, doesn't mean they won't have an impact, but that it will take much longer to, to take root because of the um, uh, weakness and superficiality of, of um, uh, democracy in the United States. Uh, I want to end with uh, Tagrid. Um, till now, we know that at least uh, 49 journalists have been um, killed in Gaza. What do you say about this? And um, we see the hostile environment for Arab uh, journalists and who, whoever speak out about Palestine, he will be suspended or uh, yani suspend from their posts like uh, yep. um, Hassan Mahdi and other uh, journalists. What do you say about this? 36 Palestinian journalists were killed uh, in 31 days of the war. So almost like uh, one per day. It's very scary. It's very dangerous for reporters. Uh, I just, I have to tell you, you know, without the cameramen and the, uh, and the photographers in Gaza, we, like we, we could have uh, uh, not know anything what's happening. So thanks to them really like, you know, but their work is extremely dangerous because they go to the, uh, like, and, and you know, Israel made it clear that everybody is a target, that they cannot exclude the journalist out of their way. And, and, and the statements were clear from uh, uh, Israeli uh, officials. So that's scary. So what can be done, I have to say, we, we cannot do anything. But there are journalists who believe in their work, who believe in uh, bringing you know, like the information out, and they believe if it's a just cause, which like such is that, it's Palestinian is a just cause. So it's like they believe in it, and they, like, they 
want to cover it. They want to, like many Palestinians, still want to be like their dream is to be journalists, despite this dangerous work. So, like, think about it. Also, 50 media premises were com completely or partially destroyed by Israel, including AFP, Reuters, offices, and you name it. Uh, I, I want to, you know, like something you have to bear in mind that I, I see you guys. This conflict is not religious. It's purely political. So this is one thing you really need to remember all the time. It's not complicated, as many international journalists will always use that word, and that makes people like freeze or don't want to learn about it. This word is not accepted anymore. And if you hear anyone telling you it's a complicated conflict, stop them, because it's so simple. 48 took place, Nakba crisis for the Palestinian, and then the guilt feeling of the Holocaust made the European, which was a, a European problem, made them create this, this uh, uh, you know, Israel on, on a country where Palestinians were the majority. It's so simple, it's not complicated. So Palestinians ended up paying the price of the guilt feeling of the, uh, of the Europeans. Uh, there is a difference, you know, like uh, Dr. Um, he explained it, but I would like to make, to make it very simple. There is a difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Anti-Semitism is racist. We don't, it, we don't belong there. That's not us. It's racist. We, we have to really reject it all the time. But what Israel, the machine behind everybody that is critical of Israel, the moment you criticize Israel, like a model like Gigi Hadid, Billa Hadid, like models, when they talk about the Palestinian cause, immediately they accuse them of being anti-Semitic. But that's not anti-Semitic. They are critical. It's, there is a difference, as I said, between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Uh, anti uh, so if you criticize the policies of Israel, that is a freedom of expression. That is not anti-Semitic, but they always put it to, to, like, to undermine and to, uh, to create this fear. And many people will be silent the moment you are like use the word, uh, but it's not the story anymore. Israel has failed in that there are many voices that are very powerful within, uh, within uh, social media, and they are like, it's not one. In the past, you know, uh, uh, Gaza has been attacked, like we had four attacks before that. It didn't uh, bring that attention, but now it's different. Yeah, it's I think not the only situation one, now is different. It's uh, not only one person yeah. talking against it, it's many, many, many keep talking about it. That's the only way to change, yeah, to change the situation, the, uh, the power yeah. of social media yeah. now. Yeah. So I think it was a, such a heavy conversation on the morning for you all. Uh, I want to open the floor for your questions. Please uh, keep your questions short and without comments, uh, and choose uh, which one of the panelists you want to direct the question. So, questions? I would start with the beautiful lady in the middle, yeah. Can you give her a mic or? Hi, thank you everyone, um, and very insightful conversation. So my question um, pertains to the future of Palestine and the future of Gaza. Um, a recent interview by Ezra Klein to Amani, my, her name is escaping me, um, the dean, sorry, Amani Jamal, the dean of Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, she conducted a poll in Gaza that ended on October 6th. And she found that 67% of the people had no trust or little trust in Hamas. My question is, how do you build a government moving forward where people today don't trust Hamas? Thank you. For the question for, okay. Either. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Another question. Uh, yeah, here, Ahmed. Uh, I'm really sorry, uh, it's not going to be a question. Uh, I, I have a comment, if you don't mind. Um, as fast as possible. <coughs> all right. 
I'm, I'm a Palestinian uh, refugee, refugee who was expelled in the 1948 to the West Bank and in the 1967 to Jordan. Um, the point is that I think that we really struggle in the pro-Palestinian side to, to make our point uh, once we really consume our time in arguing and discussing the leaves and the branches instead of talking about the roots. I think that we should make it very clear that we cannot crop the story, uh, for example, from the 7th of October or from any other date. We should go back to the original story. Yeah. For example, uh, my colleague was, was uh, talking about Hamas. I think that Israel is, is trying to sandwich its agenda. So the sandwich cover is going to be uh, anti-Semitism, is going to be terrorism, is going to be defending itself. But the issue is that what, what we need to make it clear is that they were founded as a resistance. So if you want to wipe out Hamas, it's very easy and simple. They were founded in the 1989 for one reason, to resist the occupying Israel country. So just end the occupation. It's so simple. Um, sorry for the time. Thank you. Uh, I will hear, okay, 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 from the back. Yeah, the lady on the back. Quick question, please. Yeah. مرحبا. Uh, أنا بس عندي تعليق بسيط uh, ما عندي سؤال. Um, أنا وعندي يعني انتقاد للبانل ديسكشن يعني إنه هي عم تصير بال باللغة الإنجليزية بلغة أجنبية نحنا كعرب بعتقد حتى لو في في عالم مش عرب عم يحضروا معنا بعتقد نحنا لازم يعني قبل ما نحرر فلسطين ميدانيا وعلى الأرض نتحرر نحن عقليا ونحكي بالعربي بس هيدا هو التعليق اللي عندي uh, So we have uh, around like 80 I'm not sure correct me if I'm wrong 80 delegates from different parts of the world I don't think that but all of them yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah I just Arabic, telling her that طبعا طبعا بس في كمان solution تاني اللي هي انه نجيب translators بس هيدي هي اللي عندي اياها Okay, thank you Shukran. for your comment. Thank you. I think we have some questions here. Yeah. Um, I will have Salumi and then um, you after her. Yeah. So my question is to Tagreed. As a journalist, it is obvious that we can't rely on the West because as he stated, most individuals want to hear from white individuals before they believe. Those white individuals are not going to humanize the Gazan story. What do you think that without relying on the Western governments, because they're obviously not going to do what is right, those of us who are not within the West, what do you think we can do since we can't go into Gaza to report and humanize what is happening, apart from protest towards governments that are not going to act, what do you think we can do to help the situation? Okay, thank you. Yeah, here. I think should we start taking questions and then answering and then maybe no, one no, by I one? No, no, I will have your question first. All right, yeah. thank you. Uh, my name is Vieran, I come from Croatia. And uh, living in Brussels first, thank you for this refreshing discussion. It's really nice to hear opinions that uh, we unfortunately do not get to hear enough of. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, my question would be coming forward um, after this war is eventually over, um, sooner rather than later, I hope. Do you see, uh, without the support of the United States and without the support of most of the European Union countries, uh, coming forward, do you see something uh, that happened like International Crime uh, Tribunal uh, for Yugoslavia uh, taking the same place for Gaza and then people who are guilty of this crime actually being uh, litigated and then prosecuted for the crimes that they've committed against humanity? The same way that uh, leaders of former Yugoslav republics and um, their military were prosecuted in The Hague. So do you see it uh, coming forward? Okay. If yes, how? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. We have now three questions. Uh, I will handle the first question to you, Moheen, to answer about the trust of Hamas and the future of uh, government. Well, just briefly, first, the comment about the language of this discussion. Uh, Norman doesn't speak Arabic. Uh, English is my native language and Tagreed was asked to speak in, uh, in, uh, in English, so. Um, and 
I think well, we have audience, most of the uh, delegates some, here the are from different parts of the world and they are speaking the other languages than that. English, but English is the common language here. I'm sorry for that. I would love to speak in Arabic, uh, of course, but this is the situation for the forum. Thank so, you. So um, regarding your question, I think um, we need to understand how these institutions work. Um, they exist to ensure impunity for one set of violators and prosecution uh, for another. So you take the International Criminal Court. Um, Norman has written a book about this. I mean, these, these people have turned dragging their feet into a form of art um, when it comes to the Palestinians. Um, the United States and European governments have worked assiduously to ensure that not only is, does impunity for Israel uh, persist, but to punish anyone who tries to challenge that impunity. So um, if there is, if, if Israeli leaders are going to be held accountable, it's not going to be because of these institutions, but despite them. Um, regarding the question about... Um, Can you, uh, yeah, the first yeah. question about Hamas, um, yeah. I, I tend to be um, skeptical of polling of Palestinian public opinion because I find it very fickle and that it often reflects a uh, very um, rapidly developing uh, news environment. So the one, the one poll you cited, it may be entirely correct, it may be um, entirely um, uh, off the mark. What I will say is, and if I understood your question, it was about how are Palestinians to form a government in the future. I don't believe in elections under these uh, circumstances for a whole variety of reasons I won't get into now. Um, but to me, it never made sense that a people who have not yet achieved sovereignty or independence or self-determination are, are, um, are holding elections about you know, who gets to clean the outhouse and take out uh, the garbage. Um, so my, my response to your question would be that you have a broad spectrum of Palestinian movements. The participation of all is required to mobilize an entire people. And what we really need is pluralism and power sharing um, uh, and political participation by as broad a spectrum as possible as opposed to having an election where one party wins and everyone else loses and is, is excluded, whether it's uh, Hamas winning or Hamas losing. I don't think that the current Palestinian reality can bear being led by only this party or only that party. Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> I mean, without, uh, in regard to your question, without uh, the change of uh, policy and by that I mean the U.S. Uh, stand. Uh, nothing will change. The sad part, I'm so, like, you know, like, take it, like, me as an example. I have my family in Gaza, okay? They are displaced for the first time in their life. So, so at the beginning, I was angry at Hamas, you know? Hasn't you measured the consequences of this act, you know? Like, you didn't think what's coming after? So that's my thinking at the beginning. But then, when several European countries, including where I live now, the Netherlands, which has the city of justice, The Hague, where the International Criminal Court is located, together with the US, their, their, their position was, Israel has the right to defend itself, period. They did not say, but, with consider, like, Okay, but respect international law. That was not mentioned at all. So someone like me, I was, all my anger has shifted to the international community, and not all the international community, because you have 120 countries. That is the real international community that voted for a ceasefire, except the US, except a country like the Netherlands that has the International Criminal Court that abstained. So. The question to them, like, you know, like you have many European countries, they are against immigration. Okay, that's your position. But how the hell you are pro-war? How the hell you do not vote for a ceasefire? 
given that your program, we have elections now, their program, like many of them, many of these parties, they are against immigration. But how come your stand is pro-war? This like, and you know, like the double standard between Ukraine and the Palestinian story, like what's happening now, the, the, the double standard in the coverage, in the statements by these uh, uh, international uh, officials, the US mainly here, and the Europe, some European countries, it's pathetic. It's like, you know, if you cut wat water for Ukraine, that's terrorism. And look what they are doing for Gaza. Nothing, even a hospital. They gave, it, they gave Israel the green light to destroy a hospital, to, you know, like to attack a hospital. So what we can do, and uh, yes, yani uh, what we can do yeah, for on, re in, on regard to Hamas, the outcome will determine the popularity of Hamas on the ground. So we, we don't know yet. So this is like, it, it is a, like, think about it. I covered the second Intifada. During the second Intifada, Israel practiced the pinpoint uh, assassination policy, if you remember. So many civilians were killed among them, like, like when they assassinated the founder of Hamas, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, they killed him. They killed the most charismatic leader within Hamas, Abdel Aziz al Rantisi. They killed the most moderate leader within Hamas, Abu Shana. They killed all of them. Has Hamas ended? No. Look a different generation, and they went even, even far. So that such policy does not um, help a moderate voice. So options for Gaza, because I think it's uh, important. We will wrap up with this question. I think we because have uh, less than 15 minutes. I will handle to Dr. Norman, but before I think there's some questions here, I will take them. Uh, Sorry, I'd like to, if I can, I'd like yes. to briefly comment on two yes. questions that were asked already. Yeah, please. And uh, uh, specifically uh, the possibility of the prosecution. Okay. Number one, so now this poll result is being shown that the people of Gaza hate Hamas. The people of Gaza want Hamas to be defeated as if as if they care at all about what the people of Gaza want. <laughs> the people of Gaza voted for Hamas. Did the United States approve what the people of Gaza wanted? Did Israel approve what they wanted? No. The day after the election, they tried to get rid of Hamas. In 2007, the United States, Israel, and elements of the Palestinian Authority, they organized to try a coup to get rid of Hamas. That's when the people voted for Hamas. And now, if you follow all the coverage, there's a lot of talk about what are we going to do about Gaza? So one day they say, we'll have an Arab force come into Gaza. Another day they say, we'll bring in the Palestinian Authority into Gaza. And they come up with all of these schemes. The one thing they never asked, go through all the coverage. The one question they never ask is, what do the people of Gaza want? That's not even a question. They pretend they come out with this poll saying 67% of the people are against Hamas, as if they suddenly have become converts to democracy. They care about what the people of Gaza want. But when it comes to the solution, the one possibility that's never asked is, let's ask the people of Gaza what they want. No. That's not even a possibility to ask them what they want, these great believers in democracy. And the second point, I'll make it very brief. I heard one of your questioners ask, say, 
well, we can't trust white people to speak on our behalf. We need non-white people. Now, I agree with the panelist who says, if you're white, you get a hearing, and if you're not white, you don't. It's true. I'm not going to argue with that. But it's not true that if you're white, you can't be speaking on behalf of the people of Gaza. There were 300,000 people in Washington last week. Of those 300,000, about 250,000 were white. White people can care about the people of Gaza. The problem is not whether you're white. The problem is when you get into those institutions of power, you can be black, brown, green, yellow, or orange. But once you get into those institutions of power, you have to say what power wants you to say, or you lose your job. That's the problem. The problem is not whether you're white. The problem is whether or not you are in the elite. And once you're in the elite, you have to do what they tell you, or you're no longer in the elite. Thank you. So we still have 10 minutes. Uh, I think, okay, I will have only one question and to be so short and we will have, we will have a coffee break after that so you, all of you can ask, uh, ask them. So I think I didn't take a question from here. Yeah. Um, the gentleman in the, uh, in the blue suit, yeah. Um, thank you very much. I'm Brian Said from Mauritania. Um, since the, the beginning of war on uh, Gaza, we've seen like uh, presidents, um, deci decision makers, <coughs> uh, gatherings in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in different countries. And however, um, the, the war is still uh, going on. Um, um, uh, my question is, what the, um, the decision makers, what the world has to, to do to stop this uh, genocide and stop war on Gaza? Thank you so much. Do you want? Sorry, your question is, what, what needs to be done to stop this stop war? This. Yeah, and adding to, to this question, can you add on the future of Gaza? Do you, is a ceasefire is likely? Yeah. What, what's ga the situation would well, be? Well, I, th I think what needs to happen for this war to stop is the costs of this war to those conducting it and supporting it um, need to um, exceed the benefits of it continuing, and, and that can happen in various ways. It could be an Israeli military failure. It could be a fear of um, uh, regional escalation, which is where other con countries might become more concerned. It could, referring to a previous question, be politicians uh, worried about um, worried about their uh, political future on the basis of the position they take. You know, you look at you look at um, the UK Labour Party, which is in opposition now. Uh, very interesting dynamics here, where where the leader who ran on a kind of Stalinist uh, platform of, you know, you have to follow the party line or you're ejected uh, from the party, just lost 10 members of his shadow cabinet because they insisted on supporting a ceasefire resolution in a parliamentary debate. Um, anyway, that uh, um, there, it, it can happen in various ways, but ultimately, people look at this, they don't, they don't look at civilian suffering, they don't, um, say um, enough children have been uh, killed and this needs to stop. Unfortunately, they look at it through cold calculation of their interests as defined um, by them, which can be various ways. And once they come to the conclusion that the continuation of this war um, uh, is bad for them, that's, wh that's, when it'll, uh, that's when it'll stop. And your question was the future um, it's very difficult to say. Again, I'll, um, in the interest of time, I'll just um, uh, repeat uh, what I said earlier, is that Israel is hoping to use these events as an opportunity to either depopulate uh, the Gaza Strip or failing that, um, to 
make the Gaza Strip unfit for hum human habitation, or fa failing that to completely transform the political and military uh, realities uh, in the Gaza Strip. At this point, I'm inclined to say that they are unlikely to achieve any of those objectives um, in full, um, but that also doesn't mean um, that it's over uh, for them. And it also doesn't mean that just because Israel fails to achieve its objectives in full, that somehow life will get better uh, for the Palestinians. Unfortunately, I see it getting very much worse um, in the coming days, weeks, and months before there are uh, prospects for improvement. And I don't just want to say what I expect. I also want to say, here we have yet another war, um, Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip, whatever you want to call it. Um, at some point, people should be able to conclude um, that if you don't grab the bull by the horns and if you don't muster the political will uh, to um, end the occupation and you know to get back to your to your question and norm's response to it let's have a public opinion poll about what palestinians think about israel not just what they think about hamas um, and let's consider that also a legitimate um, uh, premise for uh, political action but at some point, I think people have to recognize um, that unless the occupation is, is brought to an end, it's going to keep getting worse. Um, you know, the first intifada was bought, fought with stones. The second intifada was fought with um, Kalashnikovs and suicide bombs. Um, this one is being um, uh, fought with, you know, much more uh, advanced weapons. Uh, who knows? Uh, who knows um, what what the next one um, uh, could be like? In other words, it's going to keep getting worse, um, and not just for the Palestinians, uh, but for everyone involved. And at a certain point, one would hope that people realize this. And here, you know, again, we see the growing chasm between the international community on the one hand, which for decades has been very clear about how this. Um, uh, issue needs to be resolved. So you have the international community with a cl very clear view, and then you have the West, along with a few sinking South yes. Pacific islands um, that consistently votes um, uh, against this. Yeah, I was I was hoping to hear that this, there would be a ceasefire. Uh, I want to also to wrap up with uh, yeah. Tarid in two minutes, please. What's the future unfolding for for Gaza? The, the sad part, we have Netanyahu, who doesn't want to end that, because the moment it's uh, going to end, he's going to be, you know, there will be an investigation against him, he has a trial, whatever, so, so and, and think about it, the, inter the, the U.S. gave him the green light, how can he stop now? It's, it's, uh, it's just like it came to him um, so easy this time. But the thing is, what, what, what's for Gaza? It's, it's devastating. I mean, like ele more than 11,000 like killed is not enough till now. More than 4,000 children, it's not enough. It doesn't shake, it doesn't change. And that tells us one thing, humanity has failed Gaza. It's really, really like sickening that we are, that the, the world is okay with it. Kill more, like, but it's, they are not putting, think about it, Kosovo, they exerted an effort to impose a solution, but here they are telling us, no, international law is for the weak, get a life with it. When it comes to Israel, Israel is above the law. That is the lesson learned, you know, when it comes to this. W how I see it, th there are a uh, few options for this to end. You know, I, and then the slogan, I only believe in one slogan, that is no justice, no peace. That's the thing when it comes to uh, this, uh, this uh, just cause. Um, the, there are a few options, like two-state solution is one 
one option. I would like to, to talk about yeah the, the the current situation, not the future. Like no, no, yeah, no. Yeah. But but it has to be like they have. Uh, what is what can come out because yes. it has to be a political solution yes. to end. Because if you say okay, the United Nations to take now like the uh, UN forces yes. to take over Gaza, it's not a solution. It's uh, yeah, and Arab forces they will never accept. So it has to be a political solution. What are they? You have two sets of solution, but as long as they don't impose it, it won't work. You have one state solution, that's another uh, solution that they come out with, and it's equal rights for everyone. And then you have, okay, Israel, you want the apartheid system, get alive with it, okay, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of a criticism they will get? Is that, will Israel be happy with being viewed uh, during this century as the only uh, country that is, uh, you know, like exercising the apartheid system? And also, uh, the, the, thir the fourth one is uh, bringing the Palestinian Authority on an Israeli tank. So that will lead to bloodshed. You know, I mean, like, uh, there will be a civil war if that is to happen. So as no justice, no peace. Yes. That's what I can end I with. want to conclude with uh, Dr. Norman. Thank you for uh, staying awake with us till now. <laughs> I just want to hear a conclusion from your side. I don't think there's any point in talking about a long-term solution right now. Uh, you can't have you can't talk about a long-term solution unless you have a representative organization and a representative leadership and the palestinian people have neither right now they don't have a representative organization they don't have a representative leadership in the absence of those two things you can't talk about a final solution or a settlement of the problem there are three things we have to talk about now ceasefire now end the blockade, and stop the ethnic cleansing in the West Bank. If a second front opens up, and we still don't know, uh, because the head of the Hezbollah, Syed Nasrallah, he said he won't let Hamas be defeated. And he's generally a person of his word. If it looks like that Israel is going to impose a full defeat on Hamas, it's quite likely there will be a second front opened up. If a second front opens up, Israel, I have no doubt about it whatsoever, they will use that opportunity of a second front to expel the, pop the Palestinian population from the West Bank. So we have to focus on three things now, ceasefire, end the blockade, and stop the ethnic cleansing in the West Bank. And as for future solutions, all of these struggles, be it in Palestine or everywhere around the world, the principle is always self-determination. Self-determination. So it shouldn't be the decision of others as to what their fate will be. It's their decision what their fate will be. And they can't make a decision until they have a representative organization and a representative leadership. Thank you. Thank you, uh, our panelists, for your time and for joining us. Thank you for the audience. I'm sorry for not taking all the questions. I think in the coffee break we have uh, Wa'id and Taghreed. They will answer your uh, questions. Uh, so the hope now that you, as a future leaders, will take this knowledge and ideas uh, to achieve uh, justice, liberation, and eventually peace in the world. Thank you all. <laughs>